apparently not approach the open web. But he wrote an entire work defending the the discipline of Halakha number one. He wrote a work that, that addressed the issue of Zionism. Non-Zionism was the critical issue in the 1950s, 1960s. What's our approach? All fractures to Zionism. That was a major issue that had to be addressed. He addressed that issue. That was the Yes, the Rav speaks right. Addressed that issue. As well as called the leader of faith, which is a... Uh, that one um, just translated. Yeah, yeah, Just translated about a couple of months ago, maybe maybe six months ago. And that also just the issue of the Holocaust. What's the meaning of the Holocaust? How do we deal with the issue of the Holocaust? Modern Chirot to Chirot have all been addressed by him. Which again, not every great Gadol addressed these issues. The Ravad, for example, never addressed the issues that the Rambam addressed. And it's a personality, it's an ability to see beyond the immediate constrictions of that newness. Sometimes we're afraid of that which is new, and we're not able to really go beyond it. The issue of interfaith discussion. Most people would prefer to simply close your eyes and pretend <coughs> And it's not a problem, not an issue. I mean that in two senses. I mean, number one, in terms of the Christian world who initiated dialogue with us, we're not really interested, but should we initiate it? Is it important, not important? What should we do? And he, in a very characteristically analytical fashion, was able to set out a policy as to what's right, what's wrong, what's right issue, as well as the issue of dialogue with reform the of Jews. Most of us, I'm not getting involved, I'm just going to close my eyes to it. He said no to that. That would be self-defeating, would be inappropriate, would be wrong. Rather, he set out very clear guidelines as to how to make that work for the general cloud Yisrael. He saw the broader picture. He has that perspective of being able to not to be reacting to the moment, but rather as to what we are as Jews, who we are as Jews, and what's right for us as Jews, as a people that's Am Olam, an eternal people. You can't address an issue only from the perspective of the immediate present, but you must see it as well from the long-range perspective of the Taken Olam B'Kushadai. All of that is part and parcel of Rabbi Soloveitchik, a very unique personality. <coughs> we began reading about his Nayat al Tefillah, and you'll see, as this work, as all of his works, there are unique ideas, uh, original ideas, ideas that would not, you would not find any other context. If you were to compare his ideas, to be sure, if you were to compare his ideas with any other modern thinker from the traditional world, you'll see how strikingly original his ideas actually are. He begins this essay on ideas about tefillah, and I took this idea, this, this particular topic because we all know about tefillah, we all know what tefillah is all about, and it's unusual to say, I'm going to tell you about tefillah. No, Rabbi Soloveitchik, in fact, will give us a completely different perspective as to what tefillah is all about. He began his thinking on this issue of tefillah, and he's addressed this concept in different works, in different works, because it's very important. Tefillah is something which is an internal and external mitzvah. And those are the ones which he's most concerned about. Avelut, tefillah, things like that. Wherein you have an internal reverberation from the external deed. Tefillah could only be external. He rejects that. It could be internal. He rejects that. Halakha's uniqueness and brilliance is that it binds together an external behavioral mode doing something with an internal sense of effect, emotion. The dialectical tension between external and internal is the precise point on which halakha turns. One has to appreciate that fully. One cannot just do a mitzvah, just do it externally, nor can one allow a mitzvah to dissolve into an internal feeling. He makes this point in Isha Halakha, who talks about Ish Haddat and Ish Haddat. Ish Haddat is a romantic religionist, famous in the end of the 19th century for the religious romantics, meaning that religion becomes this kind of hazy, blurred, kind of emotional feeling that you have when you pray and everything else like that. No, it's not. You need a discipline. You need a structure, on the one hand. On the other hand, to only have a, a structure, to only have a discipline is not enough, and he wants to precisely hone in on that nexus point between external and internal. To be lies, one such, one such concept in the whole constellation of Jewish values. So again, he's written about this in other places, but each place is unique, each place is different, each place you see different ideas come to the fore. He began in the first paragraph of here, I'll briefly summarize it, saying that redemption is, is a basic bottom line foundation principle of Judaism. Good. But, uniquely, it's not only in the area, which you always often think about it, as the unique historic, as a national historical movement to which we are all committed. 
It's not only that. Rather, redemption is something, it's an idea which percolates in almost every area of Jewish thinking and Jewish living. Tell us how close it came that you allow to join. Everybody, everything is in need of redemption. Hatsibu and I saw it. Yes, the national historical community is in, is in need of redemption. That we all know. The individual, Gam Hayahid, Gam even in the natural world. It's an interesting idea because upon what premise is the very small statement that nature is in need of redemption. What is in need of redemption? That which is not perfect. Good. That which is not perfect. There are many ills of the natural world that afflict us and hurt us and harm us. And what he's saying over here is that the natural order was not made perfectly so. We don't perhaps know exactly how, but we think of natural evils, earthquakes, volcanoes, hurricanes, we're in some kind of evil results from this natural evil, this natural phenomenon, call it. He said to us that Teva, nature also is in need of perfection. Sure, absolutely. That's a major, major question that one has to raise. But the question on one hand is going to the very Mahaseha um, Boreh. And it's trying to understand why this wonderful created an imperfect world we have to begin by hesitating and speculating and thinking that this is, can we ultimately know what Hashem really wants from creation. With that warning, certainly there are those who will say that God created the world in need of perfection for us to serve that world of perfection. Notwithstanding the fact that he was placed in Haram, right? He was viewed as a heretical in his time, 16th century, 17th century, I think. But uh, he was 18. Early 18. Yeah, 1700s. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure. I want to check on that. Shaddai was a little bit later. Shaddai was later. Shaddai was later. Ramchal, so I'm going to get to the two. Shaddai and Ramchal. But um, he was put in Haram, and of course his works are widely read today and, and very much respect. So one has to always be careful from that point of view of one age's heresies and other age's orthodoxy. Keep that point in mind because it often comes up in life. And he said also that a Kadosh Baruch created a world in order to perf- help us perfect it because we, re- re- his point is we are able to get a sakhar, a reward by virtue of perfecting it. For us to be born into a perfect world and nothing for us to do would be irrelevant to us. Rather, he wants to grant us reward and he grants us the reward by virtue of our intended act of perfection. We intend to perfect the world. <coughs> But the issue over here is not simply the moral evil that people are guilty of, but rather even teva, even the natural order. <clears throat> Science plays a role in this. There are going to be natural ills, sicknesses. What's our role? Our role is to see the sickness in its broadest perspective, which is we should be able to perfect this world by virtue of curing that illness. If cancer is not an illness of the natural world, where, where a cancer cell goes crazy and multiplies at an absurd rate, then our obligation as a mitzvah is the taken olam, olam in the natural sense. We should intend to cure that illness. That's part of what Hashem wants of us. So the world is natural. It's part of a natural order you will have all kinds of natural disasters, whether they're floods, whether they are uh, <coughs> earthquakes, whether they're hurricanes, and we have to do that which maximizes the most important teaching of Judaism, which is... Sorry? Yes, but that's based on this, this teaching. Seven Elohim. That every human being is of infinite value, infinite worth. Now, once I appreciate the fact that every human being is of an infinite value of worth, think when I build a building, how should I build it so it doesn't crash? If I build a building as they do in, where they do it last month? Not in Mexico. In uh, South Korea, it fell down. North Korea. It fell down, right? Don't you go to Korea? No. Oh, yeah. no. It wasn't no. earthquake. No. Well, the department store fell down and killed uh, a couple hundred people. And they were building, building violations. Right, right, right. Okay, so the question is, are we concerned about the Tzilim Elohim that's involved in that situation if we don't build properly? Israel now is notorious. Israel right now, they're expecting in the next 20 years a major earthquake. Israel is on the foot. The Jordan is on one of the major faults of the world, of the earthquake uh, story. And I'm uh, most spoke about it. Stein with me out of Ash. I'm most spoke about that earthquake, Ash's earthquake. And it, every so often there's a major earthquake in Israel. <clears throat> and they expect a major earthquake in the next 20 years, and it's going to be massively destructive. Why? 
because they didn't build with earthquake provisions, as there are in some buildings in California. There, are, there is codes. So now when we say that, what are we disregarding? We're disregarding human life. Do we have a right to describe human life? Torah comes up as human life is a reflection of divinity, of the in infinite spirit of God. That's what we are. We are that important. We are the crown of creation, and we are no less than divine. So our values should reflect that key value. Now if I don't do that, if I don't use my technology, my understanding to save people's lives, to improve the quality of lives, then I'm violating that mitzvah. So the natural world is natural. Olam kiminabo nohei. The world is going to be a natural thing. There's going to be all kinds of disasters in the world. But we are obligated and have the wherewithal to cure, as we've cured polio, we've cured other um, other illnesses, smallpox, so too over here. So I'm reading all of this into his one statement. Gamateva, the natural world, is in need of perfection. That's our job in this world, to perfect it. The Alam Kulam, all of the world, means Gilalau Tikkun. Even, new idea. Have a good day. Even, Mahshevet Ha'adam, man's thought, his ideas, his emotions and feelings, also are in need of redemption. That's a strikingly original thought. You would not have read any place else in classical literature the notion that Mahshevet Ha'adam, by Hadiot, his ideas and his feelings also need redemption. So what does that mean? It's an interesting idea. What does it mean? Hakora tumu mitzav v'kore Hashem yotzior v'merchav. Because there are times when a person's thoughts may be in crisis, his feelings may be in crisis, and it calls out from this point of crisis that he should be taken out of this crisis limit half to enjoy some kind of breath. Even this is this is not a, a new idea. We all know this already. But he takes it seriously. Even the divine presence itself. So to speak, Kiviachol, Nishbek was taken in captivity by Galut, his story, who met the physic, who was a pale Gula. Even the Shekhinah needs Gula. Right. Well, also, I would assume that he assumes that we know this already. No, no, no. The Galata Shekhinah is well known. Oh, but it's also a paragraph. Correct. Just one separate paragraph for that. Right. Major, major idea. That's interesting because form often is indicative of content. Here, the form is very sensitive to form, to words. The literary flow of his of his writing is incredible. It's mind-boggling. It's just the the words he uses, vocabulary, his his development of a thought, all is is very very unusual. He tells us sometimes there's an idea that is alone, that is widowed in the in the realm of thought, until comes a goel, a redeemer of that thought, and he's able to take it from its loneliness. May be duta from its loneliness and from its forsakenness, from its aloneness, into redemption, to freedom, and to centrality. Many ideas. This is so clearly true. Many ideas that Chazan had said are on the periphery of Jewish thinking, and all of a sudden, an idea is from the periphery and becomes a focal point, a center of all new Jewish thought. Keshem shagorel asher kulanu mahakim lo. So too, as the redeemer, which for whom we are all waiting. He will raise us, raise us up from the Ashpur, from the depths, the, the nation, this poor nation called Israel. Gam HaGoel HaRuhani. New idea, you never read this notion of a Goel Ruhani, who is somebody who's going to redeem a thought, an emotion, from aloneness into, into make an idea to prominence. The Takin Ra'yon, to establish a new idea, HaKimor, the owner of the to make that into the idea. The history of human thought, Mele'im Dumaot, are full of these kinds of ideas. There are many ideas that were peripheral, but are now central. And he tells us that we have this statement in Kemara as well. Man Chulin, Zayin, Dav Het, Amur Aot, Avav, tells all the time, Ma'akom Hinecho Avotai Likadir, O Ma'akom Hinecho Mei Min HaShamayim. He tells over here, there are various points, various times, when the Tamech himself will say, the early rabbis, he left me a place to shine, to get it to shine. This idea was here, he, the Chachamim gave me the right to make it here. It becomes my idea. And it's me, it's up to me to push that idea forward. What does that concept mean? There's also redemption in the realm of halachic thinking. There are logical explanations. She need donun is man rab that were left alone for much much time. Or katzal legalot itilu legula and they were kept on waiting to become redeemed for every generation until came a goel galam. For example, Rav Chaim Salavich, his grandfather, 
was a radical reformer in the realm of halakhic thinking. Nobody thought his thoughts for a thousand, for two thousand years, were kind of how he formulated new ideas in halakha. And it was in Rachel's terms, I mentioned this, I think it was two years ago, he said that before our time of Egypt, all of the Arabia was pots and pans. Kosher, not kosher, mixed milk, it was a thousand of details. Welcome to the crime cell of Egypt, and he is able to find the common thread in all of them and reduce the Da'ah to a couple of principles, simply to conceptualize it. Not simply a thousand little points, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Rather, he was able to take all those yes and yeses and yeses and able to find the reason why they're all yes, we are able to to one common concept, and once they're all one common concept, you, you see the harmony of all of, of halakha, halakha and yurei di'a. It all fits together as a beautiful painting, as a beautiful mosaic. That is halakha thinking at its best. You ask the question in halakha, it's not only a detailed issue, it's to which broader concept does that detail belong? And the Gemara does not operate with conceptual analyses. It's mainly detailed. You need the rabbi to come along a great brilliant mind who's able to conceptualize. It's, for example, analogously, the Rabbi Sadegic often likes to use science as analogies. You could observe a thousand physical phenomena in the course of daily life, right? Everything that you do, you lift your hand as a physical phenomenon, you study physics, you throw a ball, you shoot a basket, you drive your car, all these are laws of physics. We all know that. What did a number of the great physicists in the last century come along and do? And Einstein was certainly one of the last of, uh, of the great minds uh, trying to come to this, reducing all of those physical phenomena to four basic laws of physics. You know, only four basic laws of physics, and they're trying to come to that one unified concept, one law that will explain all physical phenomena, one law. So it's, it's, a, it's an act of seeing what's common, that me lifting my arm and me throwing the ball, but it's the same law of physics and understanding what is that law of physics that binds together all these issues. With this question of, for example, in, in the realm of energy, light and heat are two physical phenomena. Are they different the same? Where are they the same? Whether I explode an atom bomb or I open a light, I'm doing the same physical act. It belongs to one law of physics. Right? We all know that. So to in halakha. There are many details in halakha. But you, for the Arab so they able to take all these details and conceptualize them into one whole. That's what it means by a go'el, by a book, somebody came along and able to see the, all those little details and say they're all interrelated into one harmonious, tranquil picture. Truth has to be total and has to include all of those concepts. Of all those into one concept. If, for example, what happens if I'm able to explain ten different acts of damages by virtue of one principle, right? Whatever it may be. And there's one given out someplace where that given out does not fit into my conception. Let's say it's Adam al Olam. One easy example, right? It means a man is always responsible for whatever damage he does. Okay, but I find one example he's not responsible. So my concept is wrong. The concept has to explain all the details, right? So the concept may be wrong. It's painted a picture with all that's in place. It's a puzzle, but there's one thing that's out of it because that one halakha is not, is not explained by that broad concept throughout the picture. Do you, you see why? Is it obvious? Am I clear? You think you look... You're not clear. No. It can be included in that concept. It, it's not good. It's not the concept. Yeah, concept. So Rav Chaim Salvation was able to find the concept and define that concept perfectly enough to explain <coughs> all of your day And in other areas as well. Take out all of the details and unify them into one concept. Therefore, if you know all halakha, it's just all true. That is exactly what the Rambam did. The Rambam wrote Mishnah Torah comprehensively because truth is comprehensive. You have to know everything has to this one picture called truth. If you want to get to Buddha Olam, you have to know the whole picture. If you only have one part of the picture, you're not getting truth. And if you don't have truth, you don't have Buddha Olam. You need to, to know truth or to know God. All of that. So, therefore, the Rambam and Rosh Hashanah again are the same. Rosh Hashanah believed in comprehensive knowledge, but not only knowledge of Halakha and Ashkafa and the and all that, but even scientific knowledge fits into this total world view. All knowledge has to fit into the total world view. So now, here we are, this, this last paragraph, look to panic bit over here. Right? The Redeemer could be one of Hachmei Israel that the Hashgacha has chosen in order to take out that logical explanation. 
from its aloneness, from its periphery, and bring it to the center of halakha. What's one example? Idea, idea, an idea, halchatit ahat. There was one halakha idea that was alone for a period of time, zimani. And it was redeemed. It was redeemed ultimately by was redeemed ultimately by the Rambam. What idea is this? It's called Avodah Shabalev. Now what does that mean? The concept of Avodah Shabalev was established by the Achmei Talmud, the Kamei 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 Many times the Achmei Talmud will talk about Avodah Shabalev, internal worship. But <coughs> despite the Rashad, the Achmei Talmud spoke about it, prayer always remained mitzvah mitzvah to him. It always remained as a rabbinic commandment. And was never established in the center of Jewish thinking. Yeah, anywhere it studied this always wondered. How could it be that prayer, which is such a basic category of Jewish thinking, Jewish living, is only the Rabbanan? Not being, I understand it. You have, have entire Talmudic pages and chapters and Masechtot to read prayer. And yet it always remained peripheral. Many spoke about the Tila. The Kavu 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 in other words, what you're thinking about is that now in the 20th century, we see the centrality of prayer. Right? Hold on, when was the Abidah established? After. A thousand years after Jewish history. A thousand years. Right, that's 300 before the, before the common era. And even then. Oh, you're, you're, you're thinking of the, the as we have it today, or in a general sense? Well, we're going to see how we analyze this concept. Because we'll go in Beit Sarah, the, uh, the Yehudim would gather and pray. Right, but why wait for Beit Sarah to pray? Now, even that I'm done with say Beit Sarah is the Oraita. Everyone would say it's the Oraita. Fine. But normally, I have Beit Sarah today. I have Beit Sarah, so I'm happy today. Don't pray. Oh, you listen to the class, come up. I'm going to pray. Well, that's strange, because is not enough food would be standing conscious to that concept that the soul is always praying. We should be in the constant state of Tefillah. Of course, it looks about that, as well as the Quran, but quite similar to that also. But the point over here is that prayer, look at the Sidur. When was Sidur first written? The first organized Sidur. Oh, 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 oh. Which is the ninth century after the common era. What were all those days before? What was central in the times of the Talmud? Was it prayer or was it Korbanot? It was Korbanot. Or all Korbanot. Maybe he said Kiryat Shema. Maybe he said Kiryat Shema. Maybe he went to take Kiryat Shema. It's from the Rambam But it wasn't the, the, the prayer as a disciplined action. Now, don't look at this whole issue from the point of view of now in the 20th century. We do see prayer as central. But the only one that central with the Avab. There was a Galut. The Jews went to Babylonia. And now to the dead, Kinesit became a place to pray and to study. Kinesit, of course, means to well, gathering uh, prayer. Uh, I mean, that's a fear. Now, now you're posing another question. If we were able to make Corbano today, would we have to pray? That's another question. That's an entirely... I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested in the issue. I'm that's saying that... That's a different question. Yeah, it's a different question. I'm saying of you, but in the time of the Dash, you know, what was focal? Corbano. Mm -hmm. When the Jews were exiled, there's no more Corbano. So what do we do? Un right. right. Then we had to start using oh. Tefillah instead of the Corbano. Mm -hmm. And in Babylonia, in Babylonia, they stopped... Yeah. I'm sorry? Yes, yes, yes. Correct. Also, as well. All post that. All the abad. Allah chatechila. Should not prayer be abudashe by Lord that I do the chatechila? Let's see how we develop this concept. So it was not tefila was not the tibura in the center of Jewish halakhic thinking. Many have thought about tefila. Many many halakhot were established about tefila. However, hanikuba merkazi. What is prayer really all about? Abudashe by Lord, which is the Worship of the heart, Heketa waited to be redeemed. Was in wait, was waiting, was waiting for the redeemer to have a good day. She had gish orta to emphasize it and give it its definition. Hashkacha gezra, the divine providence, decreed 
He go air to learn everything. So and so as a redeemer will come and redeem it. Where's the Hayyad Ramba? Quote. In other words, you look at all the halachic compilations prior to the Ramba. If you allow to be spoken about, has a formal exercise that we have to do. We're going to see do the Rabbi Ramba. We're going to look at all these other things. If that has a formal, disciplined act that we do, we pray morning, noon, and night. Halachot. But his point over here is that it was the Rambam who decided that Tefillah is essence, essentially defined. Its essence is defined as what? Not as formal discipline, for morning or night, but rather as Abedah Shebalim. Completely different story. Let's see. He tells his quote, I call Tehillim, so everything is going to do with, with Mazar, with what? I feel as if Tehillah Shebalim, Tehillim is Gemara, right? But let us afford the Mashal, maybe in my court, Chazar, Adavar, 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 Take about it as a for example. They bring original sources of the rabbis and the pasuk of the Bechol of Right? They bring the sources. Sorry, they bring the source of Chazal and the pasuk of the Bechol of Right? They ask the question. Ezo hi avodashi by Lord. No one is at the fila. They said, this is the club. Good. Afar pifu and drashah zu loshin ta'ab khamdatam kira bechavat ilah. Despite this drashah, they didn't change their perspective, their stand vis-a-vis the fila. For them, prayer, the letter support always remained with the Rehem. In other words, again, you see the... the, the even though we have a Pasuk in the Torah, even though we have the Pasuk in the Torah... It's not you as the Oraita. And it's Tefillah, but it's the Rabbanan. Prayer is the Rabbanan. Once again, it's how could prayer be the Rabbanan? That's the same question. A Beracha. Whatever it is, is the Oraita of the Rabbanan. The Rabbanan. But how could Rachamim, I always have this question, how could we have waited to Rachamim to establish that I should say the Racha on an apple? To me, it's so obvious. Their whole reasoning, you know, it's Hashem's, we're going to take it. You, you want to acquire it? What do you have to do? What do you have to pay for it? Say the Racha. That's the payment for the apple that I'm going to eat. That should be the right It's such a... But we don't have a source for it. Why not? That's my problem. Why not? Yeah, Hashem. Sure. Because it's not the Racha. Why not? Because Hashem did not require a Palestine that that's what they said or that and I can't accept that. I can't accept that. Well then you have you have the burden of proof. You have the burden of proof of bringing a source that indicates that that that's that a source. Logic would say it would deem to me. I, I, I agree. That is the same analysis. That's exactly the same problem. But the court as well. Think about how many times you say the court a day. You're just trying to answer your point by saying it could be that Whatever a man said, you know, I'm going to have Shemitah, Yobel, and I'm going to have Kedumah and Ma'asir, all of that, which is done on an annual basis, that is, that is the Barakha, that is the recognition of whatever a role in the physical possession, but not, I don't have to be daily. I do daily. I go to a only once a year, why not daily? Whatever a said, you know, once a year is sufficient, you bring the Kurin, you showed me that you understand who's where, what we fit in. How okay, it? I, I'm almost one to buy that. Almost. No, no, he's right. I think he's right, but with a little too cool. I was bothered by this, but I also want the force of the question to be to be clear. First, the question is that you say 15 or 20 or 100 that I quote a day, Shah quote, and you say this properly. You what are you doing? You're, you're invoking Shem Hashem. You're using the name of God to acknowledge God's presence and your awareness that He created this this apple, this pear, this water, right? You just blew up. Most of us just blew up through. You know, you're the, the guy that, you know, works at, he's a little bit of that. You will really see people out there in the restaurants. I represent something. I understand it. It's, you know, okay, I have no argument with that. But when you say that properly, it's a very profound human experience. It should be. So how can I do that? You don't want me to do that every single day? I would only be able to answer that perhaps biblical pers- person was so sensitive anyway to a beracha, not to a beracha, to, to what he ate the apple. He saw it as a manifestation of God's power. We don't, because we plant the seed, we water it, this and that, and this to us is, we do it. Well, we don't. That's the problem. The problem is okay, the problem. we don't. We really don't. Agree. Because we don't water it, we don't plant it, we no. don't work okay, on it. Okay, good, but I'm they saying, did. Okay. So because, along with what you said, because it, not because they want to be, be quoting once a year, because, Shemitah uh, but because the process of pr- food production was so overwhelming because biblical man indeed saw God much more manifest than we see God. You had throughout Tehillim in all places where 
All of my bones say me chamocha. My bones say because when I get my bone, I go to the doctor. I have to pray for that. I have a sore throat. I get I get my antibiotic. I don't pray. He don't have it for us. Any time of any physical discomfort, or any time that and somebody who's really sensitive, even without the physical discomfort, the person woke up in the morning. He said, I could see. Wow. And I could smell, and I could hear, and I could feel, and it was a good little theme, and my back is straight, and I'm strong. All of those, the biblical man and Talmudic man also, all those, all those said, Micha Mocha Ba Hashem. Everybody was able to sense God's presence in the air. We didn't need a Berachah for that. And even worse, what's a Berachah? What's the negative downside of a Berachah? It's limiting. Why is a Berachah limiting? Because it's only that moment that I say the Berachah, if I say it properly, and it's routinized, I end up. Only that set those two seconds am I, am I focused on Hashem. After that, I feel, oh, okay, now I said my beracha. Who cares about Hashem? What's the ideal state? Be more aware beyond the beracha. I'm trying to say the beracha. In other words, a true biblical person, what's Abraham, whoever I was talking about, was always, not just when he said the beracha, but always was in tune, was tuned up. That's why the Ramam describes in the end of the thing, what is it, um, Part 3, chapter um, 51, I think it is, 51. He talks about Abraham, Zagadu, and Moshe, always antennae attuned to receive divine emanation. Always on that high spiritual level. Okay, you didn't have it in always. When I spoke to Jordan, then perhaps I'm not attuned. Moshe was doing that always being to. Moshe was, and I was like, oh, no matter what they were doing, we were always attuned to what they were doing. That's an incredibly high perspective, perception. Well, okay, so I'm at least, when I'm not talking to Jordan, but I'm, I'm still tuned in. But, you know, half the time I'm I'm still tuned in. Right? <laughs> All right, so I don't look that. Or a third of the time, I'm able to still tune in, to, to, to have my mind focused on the ultimate reality of Buddha Olam. So that's why Berakha denies that. Berakha gives me the opportunity. So Berakha, I didn't forget about you, who cares about you, God, at that point. So perhaps we could say that up to Hachmat Talmud, you don't need the Berakha because you were tuned into the flow of the natural processes. When you saw the sunset, you thought of saying Berakha. When you had seen a flower and you smelled it, you thought of Hashem without needing the Berachah to remind you of God's presence. So, Achmer Talmud came along and said Berachah as a need, as a Medi'avad need. So that Tefillah is in the same issue over here. What is the essence of Tefillah? Abdash Shibaleh. It's worship of the heart. It's not verbalization. The Rambam was a great proponent in Moreno Bukhim also telling us the heart of Tefillah is what? More than Kavana or what form of Kavana? I don't know. Silent meditation is what prayer is all about. Silent meditation. What does Dumiya mean? From what? Dom. Quiet. The thought is, is, is the praise of God. You cannot verbally praise God in any which way. The Ram had this concept of Buddha Ram as this over expansive, infinite creator that we cannot even conceive of. We cannot even have in mind. So the only way of relating to it is mentally. Our, our thoughts are infinite. Our words are finite. If I have XYZ words, well, I have XYZ words. But my thought can, compre- com- can include, can include, can, can relate infinitely much more so than my verbal. If I think of Aola Gadola Gibor, then I only have these three words. That's all. But my mind is much more all-encompassing. So if I want to relate to the all-encompassing body around, I should do it mentally, which is infinite, then verbally, which is finite. Right? So that's the Rabbin's view of, of what prayer is all about. It's avodah shibah It's not simply a verbalization. It's an lid is the center of the human being. Chmeat and believe. Center of emotions, of thought as well. Can you type that the internal is much more expansive than the external? So Rambam is he who was able to take Tefillah, call it and define it as Avodah Baleg, and redeem the notion of what Tefillah really is from the periphery to the center. Even by that to support, who had the Rasha, kept it to give it to him. The Ramam is supposed to say that Tefillah is the Oraita. I was the Pasuk, all of them called about him. Let's go further, paragraph 3. Had a short Shofia, the first who appeared, he go ill, Hayaram Bam. So too is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted, that the master of the world and he who knows would be that the Rambam is going to redeem the idea of Tefillah, not Tefillah per se, but rather Tefillah as Avdash Rambam, Tehzim Roshna. The Rambam returned to its old glory, the glory of Tefillah. In other words, 
the prophets prayed in this profound way. The forefathers prayed in this profound Abu Dhashi Balog way. Then it was lost. This concept after the Nibi'im was lost. It was formalized into a structure, namely the Amidah. And then again, all he did was say the Amidah. And that's not what prayer really is all about. Prayer is infinitely expansive, not limited, finitely limited to only the words of the Amidah itself. Well, now, again, let's see what the Ramam is saying. That you have prayer with expansive up to the time of the Nibi'im, and once Ahmed al Mun establishes his prayer, then everybody ends up saying these words and no more. But they missed the point. The point of Tikkun is to be endlessly expansive, infinitely so. To pray, I mean, let's pray beyond the Tikkun. We gave the morning, noon, and night. Lord, great to say three Tikkun a day. Shahim and Han Arbi. That's it? The Rabbah would say to you, what is prayer? Are we not missing the point of prayer? What's really prayer? Abu Dasha by Lord. But it should be, at, even at any X moment, your heart should well up with gratitude of Tuburi Alam for whatever you have, whether it's children, whether it's food on your on your table, whether it's freedom, whatever it is, it's your, it's your world. You should be praying uh, more than three times a day. Compulsion, I No, no, I, I think really what he means is a continuous awareness. Yeah, okay. Not, not, not so much in terms of... Oh, it's not a verbalization not, at all. Not, it's a mental state of It's a state of mind. mental connection. Right. Mental connection. You mentally you connect yourself so overwhelmed all the time and looking for the gratitude. You can't function. You can't go to work. No, 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 no. It's no, a dialectic. No. There are times. There will be times when you should. Well, my point is that once you become formalized, you want to do that with just formal. But there are moments, what moments, that we should zap into in between the formalities. Don't you say the normal human being does that? Looks at his children. Absolutely uh, not. You know, well, look when he's disciplining well, or whatever. Well, he's not, but once in a while he stands back and he says, thank God. His point is that the once in a while should not be so up in a while. In other words, it's, it's sort of like we formally give our wives, perhaps this is a, they uh, have a rough analogy. We give our wives presents on birthdays and on anniversaries. Some of us will anyway. Some of us don't. Why? I was going to say that. But we shall improve our ways. I have nine months to a birthday and I have 12 months to an anniversary. So, I'm going to Formally. Okay, that's formal. It's important to have a formal recognition of, 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 of love, symbolic gesture, whatever it may be. But in between those periods of time, there should be spontaneous moments of spontaneous expressions of love and feeling and concern. I think most people do that. It just can't okay. be all the time. It's, you know, I'm not saying no, but it's can't a can't be so encompassing because then you can't function. No, I think what saying is, you, know, you have different functions in society. Are they... A policeman, you have a garbage man, you have a train conductor, you have a train engineer. If they're going to dream all day long, then society uh, couldn't function. But he's not saying dream all day long. You walk around like that all the time. Right. Wait, first of all, when you're working, when you're doing what you have to do, that's what you're concentrating on. Good. But you don't do that. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's what you're concentrating on. With everything that you're doing, there should be. A subliminal sort of awareness. Right. A subliminal okay. awareness. Okay, right. that's the question then is how subliminal? Could you function if, if it, it's always in the forefront of your mind? The, 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 the answer will ultimately be that when a person is sitting around with his buddies and you're talking about uh, life and success and, and, and all these things, to the extent that a person recognizes and, and is able to verbalize when the opportunity to verbalize exists, if he verbalizes that, then you know that even when he's not verbalizing it, it's subliminal it's part of his, it's, okay. it's part of his most, consciousness. I think most people do that. I'm not sure that most people do that. I think maybe most people that you know, perhaps, that you associate with, perhaps. But then again, there's a very large number of people. I even think, think that his associates, which I'm one of, don't always do that. So I don't feel that it's, it's, I don't feel I'm tuned in enough, but I'm aware enough. Well, that's the narrow of what saying. What means enough? That means when I'm in work and I have things no, to do, I should stop. No, 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 no. It starts to limit your, your function. No, you know? that's all. You, I you go to work at function you know, perfectly well. 8.30 it's, 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 till 5 o'clock, whatever. I'm jumping here and jumping there. Okay, I don't have time to sit back and enjoy this. Is a, well, Great world trade no, but that's another question. Fire alarm system. I, I would lose my uh, my ability to function. If you're talking an eight-hour day, I agree that it should be full eight hours. 
but perhaps in an hour they say that I'm jumping around and I'm completely unaware of what I'm around for eight four hours. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think any of you are completely right. The victim says, okay, it's subliminal. Okay, well, uh, okay, and so when I get a chance to stand back and say, I appreciate it. Well, then, 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 the Chosot and the Rambam Zachal and Yort Hamachzir Rambam had the merit of returning the Tefillah to focus. To focus. Real Tefillah, Tefillah not as discipline, Tefillah not as structure, but Tefillah as spontaneous expression of Rabbi Shavuot. What do you mean? Tefillah to Rambam, the effort of Rambam, the Shetak of Tefillah, in the area of Tefillah, Ma Chachni. What does that mean? Revolutionary. Revolutionary. Ma Chachni. Right. It's a Ma Pecha. Ma Pecha. It's a funny word. Ma Pecha. Revolution from two angles. It's Mahpecha, right. It's Rabbi Shatur, two angles. First of all, who he chriya halakhara ma'aseh. First of all, he established as a halakhara ma'aseh, as a, as a halakhara ma'aseh, as a practical halakha, kitfilah hi mitzvah ma'aseh mitzvah Torah. That's amazing. After 1200 years after Haqqamah Tamur, the Rams come along and say, kitfilah has to be Yoraita. Very good, but in contrast, kim'an l'muskam, in okay, contrast okay. to almost all who was agreed up to that point. Most people said that only the rabbis said you're obligated to pray every single day. So the Rambam took the pilah, came with the and made it the Why? I mean, that's an amazing thing to do. You have 1,200 years of halakhic activity. 1,200 years. We're trying to go back to the Rambam, right? 1,200 years. And everyone up to that point says, Dirabanan, 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 Dirabanan. So says, no, it can't be Dirabanan. Why not? Now, it's the question. Put pressure on the people. Not put pressure. Ah, no, 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 no. We're getting better at the philosophical. It's conceptual. No, no, no. The question over here is very interesting because Rabbeinu Abraham, the Rambam's son, also focused on tefillah. He, he wrote an extensive work called Tefillah um, al-Abadin, which means sitting on the table of the Hashem. He wrote this book. Focusing all about tefillah, making tefillah to be something much more so. More than the Rambam did. One interesting thing to do is to compare the Rambam and Rabbi Abraham as to how it makes the tefillah more spontaneous, more spiritual. In other words, it became a discipline. It became what we all do. It's not only Madan. What was it? What was it? What was I'm saying over here? That tefillah he's saying over here. He went 1,200 years beyond that, and he ended up saying it's Masada Tefillah. Now, what caused to do it? I have a question for you. Did the Rambam read the Pasuk, or will go before the Vatkan, and say, that's Mitzvah Boraita of Tefillah? Or did something else motivate him to change 1,200 years of halakhic thinking into saying that this must be Mitzvah Boraita? What came from the What does What do you mean? He recognized that there's a theory necessary, or there's something necessary for the human existence. Which is Tefillah. And then he found the Pasuk. Exactly. Because he has to say Tefillah is Abu Dhabi. The problem is right. Then he had to find... No, the problem is Gemara tells you. Abu Dhabi is the same. But it was peripheral. The Gemara brings the Pasuk. But that didn't relate to the... Right, right. Yeah, but that's the Pasuk. Yeah, but the Gemara brings the Pasuk. Yeah, but the Gemara brings the Pasuk. The Gemara brought the Pasuk down to Ilu, it's in Asmachta. But not that it is the source. Don't take it seriously. It's not a source. So... How do I know that there's such an idea of tefillah? But it's the Rabbanan. But it's not that it's one. But Allah Dodech Olav Archem is not one of Tari Ayman's words. It's part of the Uraita commandment. But the concept that there is such a thing as Avodah Shibalev is biblical. There's a biblical Asmachta. Asmachta. Close to that, we found a source for it, but it wasn't real. So it's, not, it's not a Torah commandment. There's so nothing in the, in the Torah. I think Jack's point is very well taken. The Rambam came to a philosophical conception, saying that tefillah has to be the Torah. That's what all being a Jew is all about. What it's avodah shebalov. But the human being has to pulsate with a need to pray, with with an expression of prayer. And whatever else was said for twelve hundred years, I am saying, the Rambam said, this is Mitzvah the Torah. And that is the first to say it. Because I thought, who would say that the Rambam? It says, yeah, we'll go to the Tefillah. What's that? It's the Rabbanan. It's only the Rabbanan. They had the Pasuk. They have no... Think about what Tosha Vod and the Gemara are saying. We have a Pasuk. Right? We have a Pasuk. And we have the concept. But it's the Rabbanan. Wait a minute. I have a Pasuk. You have a little bit of a Chol. They don't care. 
that's not to verbalize it. Maybe, well, maybe you can separate the really prayer saying. into Abu Dhashi Shepatat and Abu Dhashi Shepalit. Okay, but what is Abu Dhashi Bapir without Abu Dhashi Bapir? Nobody would accept that as at all. It's not sort of a Kabbalah. Right. Why didn't anybody think of that? That's my point. To, what was their approach to Tefillah if it's only the Rabbana? If I have a Pasuk, I'm not, this, and the Pasuk is a Pasuk. Well, the words, the formalizing is the Rabbana, but the... But they don't say it. They don't say it. Good, I bought it. They don't say it. But Rabbanan didn't say that either. He got what he said. You can do away with the words almost. You cannot. Well, we'll go forward and, and see what he said. We'll see what he says. Indeed, that's where it was a biblical period of time. Because because yes, there were no prayers formally in the biblical time. But people started out of the day. Can go back to that? We don't have to pray. No, no, no. Let's go step by step. Even nothing can go back. We need to to verbalize and formalize. Although, yes, he does say that the height of the personality should be L'chadu Miyat The Moshe Rabbeinu was prayed with L'chadu Miyat So there is a, a sense of what you're saying right now, but let's, we'll get, get to that later on. But at this point, note the concept of Tefillah by Balat is that even though I have a Pasuk, and even though I don't have what Tefillah is, it's all the Rabbanan. They didn't go that extra step. They didn't say, no, it must be all right. Why not? Of the, the expression in words is not there. It doesn't seem to be. So no, tell me that the feeling there's nobody that counted. There's nobody that counted this word that Uraita. Other than the Rambam, who in his counting, counted Tefillah as a De Uraita. They will never no, say No, 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 you're right. But again, his, the Rambam's point is the Rambam took prayer from the outfield, put into the infield, by saying it's De Uraita. Nobody else said that. And he has a Pasuk for it, but the Pasuk for it, who said you have to pray, so did Rabbanan. So in other words, and it's, there are a lot of implications to this. If you have time, let's say you have a question. Let's say I have to do Kibbutah Ba'em. Grandpa asks me for a glass of water, and it's two minutes left to Minha. Right? That could happen very often. Somebody tells you, yeah, or you have a Mahasev to Kul Halim. Anything you want to do. And you know, what should I, should I pray? Minha or go to the Kul Halim. If I say to the Abanan, I should do the Kul Halim. Why? Nobody would disagree that. Why should Kibbutah Ba'em? They want to do it as a prayer. And, and Grandpa lives two blocks away, he needs to take to the supermarket to go buy some, uh, what do you call them, uh, what do you call them, melons in Arabic? Melons. Batiyah. Batiyah. He wants Batiyah. Right. And of course you have to go now because it's on sale. It's on sale. Well, it's on sale, you got to go now. Why is it there? So, but I only have two minutes to pray. What do I do? So, if it's seven to finalize the Rabbanan, and then as they arrive, you can put up a hand, the same thing goes to the Kibbutah Ba'o, the Kibbutah Ba'o, the Kibbutah Ba'o, the Kibbutah Ba'o, the it's an interesting issue because that's a clear halakhic implication that it can, could occur every single day. Your parent goes, what they want, X, Y, and Z, and the other one is Gerabana. The other one, of course, is Safek. What's it? Right. No, I'm saying, you know, we now have the concept of Safek to Uraita Lechura, Safek to Rabbana Lechula. So if a person forgot whether they prayed or not, right, right, right. Do I pray behind the office? Oh, no, they're not. So Safek to Rabbana Lechula, you don't pray. Oh, well, you can pray with a Tinai, maybe, something like that. But, when did Rabbana? Absolutely. So there are many halakhic implications to this discussion. Let's go. Well, we condemning the Hakmiya Talmud for not talking. I know you're not using the word broadly. I'm going to tell you something. Here's the rabbi condemned the Hakmiya Talmud. I got a ban. I got a ban. That's what it means. Condemnation. It's so funny. Now I'll give you an example because we had we had a hundred women when they had Siyum Torah. Well, women divide up the women into class. You know, they all learn the Torah. Each of us is talking about 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 the Torah. So somebody walked away with a concept that I said, and I was talking about the Torah. That I said that Hashem put salt in Moshe's room by telling him he can't go to the other side of it. And that Hashem was wrong for doing so. So that's what the guy told him. I wouldn't say Hashem is wrong. I don't need that terminology. Hashem is wrong. It's not my my word that he's wrong in doing so. So it ruined so that they heard what I didn't say. Number one. And, but even if I said it, I said it perhaps in the context. Is Hashem over here pouring so ashes the Koska? They were in the book, they didn't say it about science. But of course, like, you can't say God even wrong. But that's a contradiction of terms. So I cannot write anything wrong. So if I said it, I said it challenging me to the students. Do you think that Hashem did say something that was inappropriate by pouring so much Hashem is wrong, which is not my thing? But if I said it, if you think that's what happened over here, they will do it as it was an emphatic statement rather than a question. So sometimes context is everything. So you have to ask me very simple. My problem is that the Hakmiyat Talmud. I want to understand them. I think they're right. The entire Torah in front of them. Absolutely. And they recognize that Tefillah is important. Right. But what you're saying, you're saying now is that 
Harambam focused on well, as the Let me pick an let me pick an example of something that could have happened but didn't. Let's say we have a Pasuk in Debarim that says Via Sita Atobia Shabbat. Okay. So there's two, there's two. Okay, whatever. There's two Pasuk. Now that's not we debate that every year in in our vineyard. It's not one of the Tariyat Mitzvot. But it is. How is it? Oh, well, no, it's, 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 it's being, the basis of time which all of us would have been. It is, it is a mitzvah. But it's not counting as one of the six days of Kulim. I understand, right. but so, for, suppose right. we were reading now that Harambam had focused on that. And he made it a new invention and a new idea. But it, it would not be proper. It, well, it would not, he would not be going against Hachini Atalud. It's just that he looked to the contrary. He picked something to focus on. Look, so no, 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 no. They don't have it. We have it. It's a much more radical statement than you are in class. What do you mean? They said, I think I'm going to say it's a nice thing, but it's not a mix of No, she was in a It's in a mix of This is one six thirteen. It's a radical departure. How, do you, how dare he do what I would say? I would be a question. How does that happen? Well, so I read you covers himself. How does he cover himself? Because my poem, he started that there were ideas that have to be redeemed. Hachmetim would agree with the statement. That Makum, you need to be a retired with Gadir. Hachmetim would let, it, let you rule with Gadir. Not every, when we agree with the statement, that every explanation of the Torah, in any which Pasuk, was already revealed, or Hachmetim would actually left a lot of space for you, 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 I guess you told an idea that nobody else has said about it. Hachmetim, you agree with that statement. That there is Kor Hadush, that what but you and I, in the course of our learning, could, wow, look at that point. It could be a new concept, a new idea that we didn't know what it before. We could come up with new ideas. That's a very, very powerful statement that Anahnu, who are, of course, uh, a thousand levels plus, lower than Ahmad Talmud, and everybody else will to them, what do I do not have to You agree with that statement? I'm trembling when I'm saying that statement, but I think it's true. And there are times when you and I, who are, when we're learning, we say, well, that could be it. That could be a new idea, a new interpretation, a new sevara, a new perush. And look, I hear it from my students all the time. We we'll would never have class, because kids with a fresh mind, innocent, they will give you a piece to a pasuk and say, whatever it's their sheet or whatever, but I would not have thought of it. And nobody ever said. For example, this notion that we have um, spoken about three weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, about four different types of war in Parashat Fukat. Right? I think it was Parashat Fukat. The Torah reduced the four different types of war. Now, I don't know if it's legitimate or not legitimate, but there are indeed four types of war that are going on in Parashat Fukat. What I call the Hamash of Tanai, where if you are ashamed doing the night of this, what I call the Hamash of Onish, like Amalek, where he does this, what I call the Hamash, this was in Bashi, or whatever else, Tesh of Teva, Moshe and spies, where I get it, Yahazir, right? That was the third, and whatever the fourth one was, right? Nobody ever said that before. Now, is that a legitimate new idea? Nobody ever said it before. Nobody analyzed the Shachar according to these four different types of war that are present in Pasha Right? It's a new idea. Is it a wrong idea? No, the Shachar of the Pasuks tell me that there are four types of wars, and it's not wrong, but nobody ever characterized or categorized war in that fashion. Usually it's... Uh, it's a new idea in learning. Right? So it can't be wrong. It's there, right? We all agree that the ideas are there. I simply just formulate it in a new fashion nobody else has formulated it before. Yeah, right? I have to the question is, is there enough nakamina to categorize them in this fashion? I would say absolutely yes. Okay. Why? Well, why? Because what? Because why? I would say that when we, from now on, when we analyze war in Tanakh, we should analyze them according to these types. Mohammed I. And they lose the first battle against I. Why? Because there was Muhammad. Well, now we know, because the shot helps with that. But there was Muhammad that came, Muhammad, the head of Akhan. Akhan stole, therefore they lost that battle. Now, if we, let's go one step further. Let's say there's a war that the Jewish people fight. So it's a Sunday quarter war, Sunday so quarter war. Right? I have to try to analyze what was the reason for winning one and losing the other. Now, can I do that based on a typology of the book of war for. Oh, I understand. Well, it's speculative. I agree. Okay, so now, until, but until that entire analysis has been brought forth, okay. I say, it's still, okay. it's still okay. up in the air whether or not this, these categories have any spiritual meaning. Not coming out right. in any respect, or whether or not it's just a nice, you know, 
puppy home of these these Okay, uh, agreed. Right? Okay, so uh, that speculation is part of ongoing learning. It's a, it's a good <laughs> idea. It's a true idea. It's a conceptualization of one of these technology lines. Right? Or you can analyze <laughs> 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 and see what they do that. Even service with the one done. What happened over there? Nobody ever analyzed that battle. I analyzed it. said, interestingly enough, what happened? It was in the Hamas of Tehra. How do I know that? Because for a short mess, and you would have needed, you know, short to say, you know, to some of its tracks. But that shows me that it could be, something could be given as the Hamas of Tehra, but it could, we may need a nest at a certain point, and I can't invoke Hashem, I need help at this point. However, one explains that nest whether it was subjective or objective, or everyone wants to swap. Different the five are different. It doesn't matter. So now, if I'm in, engaged in battle, there might be enough coming now that I, could, well, I should rely on Teva, as Moshe rely on Teva, but at a certain point, I'm allowed to invoke Hashem and say, I want an S this point, or I need an S this point. Or, if let's say, I'm, all of a sudden I'm attacked. If I'm attacked, what should I do? If I'm attacked by an Amalek, whether it's the Arabs, the Palestinians, or the Syrians, whatever, I'm attacked. I should, I, should I try to analyze this spiritually? We do this anyway. So we say that this attack occurred because I have fallen down spiritually in some area. And if so, in what area? Amalek tells us. Hayesha Shemek Yedeno in Ayin. Right? That's what the question If we ask that question, we could expect a Nechama. Essentially what I'm saying, and it's an interesting point that you're pushing me to say, is that if Tanakh as a whole, for us specifically, and Tanakh perhaps more extensively, is really real to us, and it's really that I, I grow and function by virtue of its concepts and principles and that is, and is not only a source of haraka but it's also a source of hashkafa and spiritual living then indeed I should be doing this I should be reading this analyzing this and then concluding certain things today as well you see what I'm saying I want to write to be more than a book of history than I do I want to be more than a book of haraka more than a book of arachim or was an extension of what I have always taught as the basic values of ideas ideas and values I've spoken about this a hundred times there's a source of all of that to me. So that morality, yes, it's there, it's attractive, yes, it's that. I'm going to step around it. I'm saying it's a metaphysical book. We're in the same metaphysical principles that apply then, apply today as well. If I'm attacked by an Amalek, it means that I did the wrong thing. It means that I can't make it from Hamashal tonight. If I, if I apply the principles there to today as well, then I can make it from Hamashal tonight. So I want to go to battle, and I'm going to learn, I'm going to get this and this, and this is what I expect to happen. And then you have to it. And then it should be done. So I want these concepts to be much more powerful. I want them to percolate within the Jewish community today as well. So I'm going to step beyond what anybody else has, has ever gone before. Nobody analyzed war this way, and nobody will go to battle and do this over here in this particular way. So and, and what I'm doing essentially is the same as I did yesterday. If we understand the reasons why there was a Hurban by Kishon, which we do, and which I do by Tzuri as well, and even as we do next week, by uh, the, I said, the time goes to our team, then can I analyze the other destructions, such as the Inquisition, expulsion, Inquisition, and the Holocaust in the same sort of way, that I have a new metaphysical principle that I have to learn from this and apply to over here, and then hopefully prevent another Hurban from happening. If we learn from what we did. So again, I'm taking the biblical models very seriously, the typology of what we know for destruction, I'm understanding them, I'm analyzing them, and I'm applying them. I, I could see that, that nobody's done this before, just in my knowledge. If we were to do this, and it's a radical, but very biblical and very appropriate thing to do. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so with all of that, so again, my original point is not whether I'm right or wrong, but rather, and that could be just, I could be both right and wrong. Perhaps it's right to think this way, but I have all of my details. Or the opposite. Maybe it is all right, but let's take it as an option. If the Muhammad Tzad comes against us, we should retrospect and say, maybe we said, Hayesha should have been an Maybe our mother came, the type of Nazis who came, came as a result of that same exact question. The Jews have never said, Hayesha should have been an ayin. Now we should know the kind of enemy that attacks when that happens is Amalek, which means what? They will attack the poor, the innocent, the weak, the elderly, and all that. And they will attack and say they keep as well as the Rashaim. Everybody gets attacked in some kind of war. Everybody gets attacked. That's what happened with the Nazis. So again, I, I'm aware that I'm on loose footing over here. Because the whole hasn't has have not been worked out. But it's simply something I want you to think about. But again, my point is if that's a you want to call it a new idea. And it's only 
it's a chunk, it's a true idea. Where it hasn't come out or not, I don't know yet. So my point, Jack, is saying that we, in the course of thinking and learning about Torah, we come up with new ideas, new ways of understanding. Change your own down. How should we understand it? Look at the Messiah's team. Okay, that's one. But then you, you may come up with new ideas for how to understand. You may, based on a modern conception of time, time is relative to motion, right? It's a new idea. Time is not an absolute, but rather it's relative to, to the way, how fast the body is spinning. So you may analyze this, this miracle, miraculous nature now in a new way. Where if my mind can break the Mahasya Bidashi rules of, of natural order. Who knows what? Whatever it may be. We continue to think, expand our minds on new scientific, new psychological, and new insightful principles. I have a friend, on the best of the day, Abner Rice, Rabbi Abner Rice, right? From you in South Africa, not Abner Rice, Abner Rice, South Africa, Chief Rabbi, moved to Riverdale, but he's now in uh, California. Spoke to him, he's about 65 years, 62 years old. I told him, could you come back and speak in our school? I'm too busy. What are you doing? What are you doing here? I got another PhD. Yeah, what PhD in philosophy? Just for us. Now, what PhD? What PhD in psychology? What PhD in psychology for? Because I never will read Tanakh the same. So what do you mean? Because the dimension of understanding the Avurah and everybody else, based on common psychological human principles, I now understand I've had much more deeply. A man of faith, a man of, who, who, who was challenged by tests and, and, and striven to achieve greater spiritual heights. Principal psychology of how people work intellectually, emotionally, Two sisters find blind to the same husband. You are an Einstein and I'll be passionate the way we understand it, you know, we are on a common level. But if we were to understand deeper human emotions, we all agree that Ashia Tana were human beings, they were not Malachim, correct? They therefore function by certain psychological principles. And if we were to uncover those principles of whatever they may be, we might understand Tanakh differently. So a psychologist may have a new insight into the four problems. Do we accept that statement? Absolutely. Okay. If, if the psychological principles are true... No, of course. It has to be no, true. No, absolutely. So, and you'll it, may it may be true today, and then the psychologists, years later, will say, no, that's that theory of uh, psychology. Whatever they do. is not no longer accepted. Right. They default sort of theories. Absolutely right. But you can certainly apply theories and, and, and look at the work and look at all the issues. Did anybody that. use, interestingly enough, we all know the concept called sibling rivalry. It's an interesting concept. It means that a brother could have a very intense rivalry with, the, with his other brother. And it's a question of how the parents stay with them and everything else. But if I use that term to apply to yourself, the sibling rivalry, one brother has these grandiose dreams of ruling over the others, and treated favorably, or kind and hand out, Hashem did the same mark. Notice how the Bidin Bidish and the same thing, sibling rivalry, kind and everyone did Achay Yosef. And by contrast, interestingly enough, how Hashem would work. Moshe and Aaron do not have this at all. So you, you see that this contrast works in the absolute way. They complement each other. There's two different models of family structure. One is disastrous sibling rivalry, and one is harmony, which puts me, so there's obviously a message over here to Now, that's the right now, one of the Mephadashim talk about sibling rivalry as a psychological condition that affects, afflicts a family. And yet, let's assume that we will both discover this concept of rivalry. One, let's assume we are at we, as people that read Tanakh and apply to our lives, should know that we as parents have to make sure that we don't create strict in a sibling rivalry. How many of us parents said, look at your brother, he was able to get 98 given you didn't get, you only got 92. All right, you know, give the 92. Of course not, but we say it always automatically. Well, your brother's a great basketball player. Now, you may not even do it verbally, you may do it emotionally, where we unconsciously favor a child who always locks and stuff. My daughter, she's a fantastic kid, she never worked, goes to bed on time, which was three weeks old, she stepped through the line. By contrast, Mordecai is a horror story. <laughs> I would say that, but I'm not. <laughs> and this kid will find every single way of getting you angry. I said so. What do you mean you said so? Who are you? I'm the horse. I'm sorry? Maybe a month from now, they tell you to take that word. Absolutely, yes. yes. Correct. Guess no, so uh, undoubtedly, you work with the devil, she's pleasant. Let's go to the boardwalk. Who wants to go to the boardwalk? She did it with Mordecai, carrying me, pick me up, I don't want to stroll, I want to stroll, give me the stroll, he wants to stroll, he doesn't stroll, he wants to 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 st
could tear apart the family, then simply why we should be much on our awareness. We should know that we're going to give more attention because he's much because he's much more difficult, and we, we tend to push the guy aside. We have to deal with him. So therefore, what do you do? You end up trying to bounce it the other way. Of course, you don't want to bounce it the other way to a degree where the devil is going to get ignored also. So he often comes to know you never ignore me. You ignore me, you never take me any place. She's right, because she's so easy that I tend to ignore her, because she doesn't know what you want, and I always, I'm always battling with the Mordecai, whatever it may be. So Tanakh, oh, correct, Tanakh wants, he satisfies you to family dynamics. All the Bereshit is family dynamics. It's all structured. Yaakov, Rahel, Ishaq, Isaac, Abraham, Ishmael, Ishaq. It's all about the word Bereshit. So we read Bereshit seriously. With the psychological awareness of it, it's one of the dimensions, one of the levels, one of the Shukhim Ani Matura that we're more aware of. But a hundred years ago, or a thousand years ago, where family dynamics was not very much anybody's awareness, we might have even seen that level of sunning Tanakh. To the contrary, the way Achmea Talmud, let's say, and Madrash, and Achmea Rishonim, they would see Yaakov and Yisar as a battle against who and whom? Good and bad, or Christianity. Or Christianity. Isaac grew Abi Adam. He's Adam. Who is Christianity? Adam. So while she was battling other religions, I'm not battling other religions. Other religions. The Muslims are part of me. The Kabbalists are part of me. The Christians are part of me. I tend to see things more psychologically, as Rabbi Salvatore does as well, by the way. So I see all that much. No one worried about these kinds of issues. They were not about. They were worried about surviving life from a Christian pogrom or from a from a Muslim jihad. What they do? So they saw different things as the message from Tanakh to us. They're not one's right, one's wrong. The brilliance and beauty of Tanakh is that they're all there. And that there are psychological dynamics and the religious parameters. It's all there that we have to understand. Uh, yeah. Sorry? You, have to you pick up what's relevant and, and appropriate. So my point is this whole polemic <coughs> is that my problem is Gadir, in Yehuli Avotai. But one can find a Hidush in Torah. It's not impossible. To the contrary, we could do it on a daily basis. You study Torah, you come up with a new idea. It's psychological or scientific, or just insightful, whatever it may be. Emotional, all of that's doable. But nevertheless, you get down to the <coughs> Maseh and the Brass Act, mm-hmm. with all of this, the Halakha, we still hold the Tzad to the Banan. Well, let's see. I don't know if I'm quoting that. I don't know. Let's that. The Rana says no. Okay, I understand. And open up Shohan Aruch and, uh, and see how Maran is prosaic, basically. And then, after all of this wonderful idea, which is valid nevertheless, Consensus still seems to be. No, but, not. but now here's another much more difficult question to ask. You took a curveball, but it's a screwball the other way, saying that let's say you feel in the depths of your soul that you have to be the Oraita, and you have, let's say, Rabbi Salavechik who may agree with that statement, or, and you certainly have the Rambam who says it is the Oraita. Do you have a right relying on this Mahalach of Rabbi Salavechik and the Rambam? and yourself, the right to be forsake like the Rambam. Most of us would say no. Most people cannot say no. At what point do you have the right, now there's two you, you, you as people who learn and involved and committed, and there's you, you who's a rabbi. Right? There's a major difference between Ashkenazim and Sfaradim. Major difference. Sfaradim would probably always say, you have no right to go to that's what Ashkenazim is, whatever he said, he is, let's say, in a story of the Bible, and I have a nice trip. That's it. So that you would not say that. He would say that he would be himself, as many Rishon, as many Acharonim would, against Shulchan Aruch, based on Rishonim, based on a Rishon. If you have an Arabian time, if you have a, um, a Ruf, let's say, if you have a, a, um, have a commentary to hang your idea on, the Acharonim would be a Chalot, not Shulchan Aruch. So he would say that, Tuban Arim Ram Aran, Batan Rabbin Yisrochu, the Rishon Aruch cannot change for Ram Aran, period. Although, it's interesting because Pri Hadash is halak on Maran sometimes, and we will go out to Pri Hadash against Maran sometimes. It's a much more complicated reality. That's true. That's only if you can find a pre-Maran basis for it. Maran himself said, I didn't come to tell everybody to give right. up. Right. Okay, so they're not telling So they're in this case, gave you, yeah, it gave you that leeway. That leeway so that if you can find an authentic Menhag or an authentic Tzach Halakha, which your community and your Avot were no hegg, Continue to be no hey, notwithstanding. Only Manhag or even Halakha. Even Halakha. Even Halakha. Oh, he just has used the word Manhag. I don't think it would apply to Halakha as well. No, 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 because I'm sorry, when I say Manhag, I mean, how would they know hey, Halakha on certain issues? Okay, well, that's what he meant by that. Okay, I'll okay. 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 what about Tefillah? 
you have a right to decide that you, again, as a lay person, and you, as a rabbi, have a right to be able to say, I'm going to a rabbi, rabbi. and he's a rabbi. Which means you go to Tzermayim, and you do certain based on the laws the Rabbi, not the Rabbi Nine. And Hashem says, look, you, uh, you do this for me, not this Rabbi Nine, whatever he may say, and then you call the Rabbi Nine. Hey, Rabbi, hey, Rabbi. What do you want? Rambam. Sorry? Rambam, you have the Gemara, you, you kind of, you know. So that's his problem, not my problem. Okay, so the answer is, now, now as a learned guy, now you've got to put the Rambam in the context of Pachmet Hamud. And you say, well, <coughs> now wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Torah told me, Aharet Abim Nahatur. Torah told me I should really look at the majority because we want to do a consensus thing. Truth, what you, what is, what you perceive to be truth in Harappa, you have to follow. Can, can you, there's a very careful, delicate, fine line boundary between, uh, between the Zakim Amre concept, which okay. we spoke about, I think it was last summer. Zakim Amre concept is that he who feels Harappa to be a certain way cannot go get an Ebrim of the Zakim Amre. On the other hand, he cannot tell people, you do this way. We can teach his opinion, to be tired of the Shachnata, and personally, personally, does he have a right to do quietly, privately, what he feels to be true? Well, Mr. Rachel Gunn is a very good example, as was the Ramba. The Ramba would go against the Gunni, against the majority, because he's got to follow truth. Truth is informed very well in our lucky process. Do you want to follow lies? Now, admittedly, we don't want to try to become too total, and therefore we have to get around the Rachel, which tells us that we should be Yoshua, the Hainal, how the Abbot had to come on Yom Kippur, which he thought was Yom Kippur. He made him come, right, because with the stick and all that, because he can't make two empty foods. Okay, it's a public issue. It's either this way or that way. Two different countings, you have to follow the majority. Agreed. But in a private area, in something that's quiet, such as Tukulai, Gerard uh, Rabbanai, do I have a right to be told on the Ramba? That's an interesting question. And again, Rabbi Salvechik often would be told there as an Aharon. I'm not saying that we are Aharonim. But do we have a right to be Tolera and Rosa? Basically, to us on the Rambach, to say, call to the lab, to call to the lab, to the right one, to the right one. I have to ask the question, how far do we go to being sure of ourselves? Can I, can I live with myself if my, my heart tells me it's the right one, and that it's right to be the right one, and, and that this is where the right one, as opposed to, as opposed to the, uh, I have one more minute, you want to just wait? You want to say, can you? Okay. So, do I have a right to call it the right one, rather than the right one? Of course, interesting also is, let's say I do call myself Father. You, you want your whole life to call it the Rabbanan. You want all the Rabbanan credit for it. I got the right to credit for it. Because I do, I, I feel it's the right part. I always said it's the right part. It's something different to it. We're afraid to something. They have about 80, 90, 120 years of life. We look at Shema, and I say, ooh, I'm very heavy. You know, why am I waiting? Because you call the Rabbanan, I call it the right part. Huh, too bad, you lose. So I wonder if it works that way. Well, we don't know. That's an interesting question. Well, I can start all over. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, but I want to. I don't know, because... Then if you hold it to the Uraita, you get the Uraita. If you hold it to the banana, you get the Parashir Yorucha on top of it. <coughs> so you, get, you did another mitzvah. Each time you did the mitzvah, you got the banana, oh. but you got also the Uraita of the Parashir Yorucha. Right. And therefore, maybe the Uraita of the banana is, is a head. That's a question. Like okay, I'll okay. read okay. that. Okay. Let me just one, one more line to finish this paragraph. The second revolutionary issue that the Rambam said, besides calling it the Orauta, when you go to the Quran, she asked him to the end of Hayyam Dhamma to live for Yom Shishim, but it was always the Rabbanan and the Mass of Pro. She needs second to prove it, and she did not sign Abu Dhashibalim. He, he makes the Rambam identified with Abu Dhashibalim. The idea, this idea, the Fiha Dharat Rambam, according to the Gatesh of the Rambam, Kol Mekifa Rukhom Nara. It is all-encompassing, and it's full and over, overflowing. Which sets in motion the, in summary, man's entire approach to Hashem. For the Rambam, prayer became the touchstone, became the focal point of man's relationship to God, which is the way I see it, which we all see it. If you like the essence of what we do to relate to Akadosh Baruch Hu. The, the great accomplishment, the halakhic accomplishment, and the new conceptual breakthrough of the Rambam, Mehavim Akshav Yisod Mutzak Ashkafat Olamenu. Mehavim now express a basic Yisod Mutzak Ashkafat a new basic principle in our overall worldview. This new idea of the Rambam 
is a new conceptual breakthrough which is expressed in halakhic thinking as well in, as in our religious worldview of our nation, of our nation. Right? So this Rambam, these two revolutionary uh, points of taking to Tefillah, putting it to the center, have its halakhic implications to it as well as our world religious out- outlook as well. These two are what the Rambam had done. We'll continue with the Rambam's ap- uh, uh, approach next week. Uh, next week, shop it out. So we'll... Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.